Welcome into the Wash Up Walk Ons podcast. It is not Drake opening it up today like he has been for so long. In fact, it's just me today, Tyler Kluver, alone here, but we have a special guest and we'll get to him in a second. Uh, Drake is, he, we gave him a vacation day. I, uh, I, you know, as CEO of the company, I, I thought that we should give him some time off. And Kevin is at the lake house as he often is. And, uh, he hasn't even gotten back to me. So clearly the podcast is, is not of importance this weekend for him, but, um, it is for me. And, uh, we, again, we have a guest, Stuart Duncan on the show today, father of Keith Duncan. And if you don't know who Keith Duncan is, then you're not a Hawk fan because Keith is a household name at this point. Stuart, welcome in. Thank you, sir. How are you doing today? I am doing absolutely wonderful. You'll see a small pool party crowd walking around in the background. I know that it looks like the place to be right now. It's, it's not bad. I got to I got to tell you. Yeah, it's you. It's uh, you could be you could be in worse places. That's for sure. That's 100 yeah, percent for sure. And um, you're here to provide an interesting perspective in, in several ways, because I, I want to talk about multiple things. I think where I want to start is as a, and you know, my mother and father are still current Hawkeye parents because of my younger brother. Um, as a parent of a Hawkeye football player, uh, really a college football player in general, but with all the racial disparity stuff that came out earlier in the summer, what was it like as a, on the parent side of things for you when all of that started to, to break down earlier this, uh, earlier this summer? Yeah, uh, being the parent of a kicker, as you know, as a specialist, it's a little bit different yeah. uh, than the other kids. Uh, obviously, anger and frustration. I mean, you're, you're prepared and ready to play, especially when they roll out the schedule and you get some sort of relief of, oh, okay, good. They went to Big Ten and, and we can play. And even though it's a Big Ten only schedule, great. Because there's a lot of kids on Iowa, you know, Keith included, that need the season yep. uh, in order to help them as, as far as an upcoming draft kind of thing. So, so six days later, when it comes down and says, you know what, we changed our mind. Uh, you're, you're stunned first and foremost. And, and then you don't go through five phases. You go through two, you go from stunned to just pure anger. And mm -hmm. that's where we're at. Yeah. That's where we're at. What the, what do you think, what do you think, or I guess, where do you think is the biggest failure in all this by the Big Ten or the governing body, the NCAA? What, what, what's the biggest issue here? Communication, far and away. Uh, and, and the questions have evolved and changed, you know, over sure. the last four or five days to, to basically boil down for me, one big question is who the hell's in charge? Yeah, you know. Uh, so if you can answer that for me, it, it would go. It would go a long ways to calming me down. It, it's a great question. I definitely don't have the answer. Um. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's just pure communication. And then when you hear, thankfully, ads starting to speak out, coaches starting to speak out, and the people that probably have the most important input were completely ignored. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's why you know, and a lot of these people. I'm speaking from the Iowa parents only in the group that we have. Right. And what we set out to do, our goal, as you include parents from other, I talk a lot with my hands, so get used to this. No, I do, uh, I do as well. As you, get, uh, as you get feedback and input from other parents, the narrative tends to change. But we've always kept on one focus, and the focus is transparency and answers. Mm -hmm. We've never really come out and said, play the season or else. Mm -hmm. We've come out and said, we need this health data because as the NCAA and the Big Ten is so fond of saying, our kids are student athletes. Mm -hmm. That's two separate things. You've addressed the athlete part. Why is the student part 100% different when the same people are making the decision? Mm -hmm. yep. you know, so, so give us that data. Give us this data because I, I think, and, and you tell me, you've been through it, I haven't. I think there's no safer place for an athlete than within the athletic facility. I mean, you couldn't have hit it on the head more. Um, that, that's the big question. And we went over it uh, last week on an episode, Drake and I hammered on it. 
we talked about how not only the environment, um, obviously you've been in the, in the facility and, and yeah. I mean, it, it's its own world, right? And not only the environment, but the motivation and the dedication to safety and health practice inside of that world of football right. is it's going to be greater than any other group of people, student body. I mean, they have, they have one goal. Like we, we said it, the players, if you ask, if you ask Keith right now, if he, if he would live in the complex, like if they got him a cot, like a hotel cot and put it on the indoor facility field yeah. and just let him live in his locker and you couldn't leave the complex. They brought food to you for all of the games. They flew you like you're quarantined straight to the airplane, straight to the field, play the game back, back to the complex. Those players would say, yes, they would all yeah, oh sign yeah. up. They would all sign up for that. Yeah. And, and you're right. There's, there is no safer place. And, with, well, and, and, and to not even, to not even be considered, Yeah. you know, and in, in the, we're, we're the ones. And when I say we, the athletes, we're the ones assuming the risk. Yeah. And, and I asked one big question that not only did I not get a response to, I didn't even get an acknowledgement of receiving is what new risk are these athletes under that they haven't already assumed in the past every time they step on the field? Exactly. Name, name, name the new risk that is, you know, and everybody's saying COVID. I mean, come on. I mean, stats all day long, 99.3% of people under the age 30 don't even know they have it or asymptomatic yep. CDC health and humans are so seriously. Now, if you're going to say heart issues off of COVID, same thing happens with all other viral risk, you know, mm -hmm. mono flu, so on and so forth. So what new risk are these players assuming that they haven't assumed in the past? Right. And, and I, I can't get an answer. Yeah. And I think it's, I, and that's, that's the question for me as well is, I, and I think, I, I think it's the, it's the unknown of it's new, right? Like it's new. It's right. something, it's something different. Right. And I, people have a hard time getting over that, that unknown. And I, and I think that I, in my personal opinion, I think it's been taken a little too far as it's, it's not, it's not really unknown. Like, yeah, it's, right. it's a virus. It's, it's flu like, so it's yeah. going to be, it's going to behave in, you know, it's going to behave a little bit different, but for the most part, it's going to behave like all of that. So, so we do know what kind of, it, it, what, what it looks like. And, and did you see, uh, did you see Dr. Catherine O'Neill from I, uh, LSU? She, I didn't. She's an infectious disease specialist that advises the SEC. Okay. Humiliated the big 10. Really? You know, because it's like, no, it's not new. We've yeah. been, we've been involved for six months now not only do we have data, but we have data from actual players. Yeah. And we coordinated with the other conferences. The Big Ten didn't want to share, didn't want to coordinate. Wow. So the Big Ten is going off of data on 47, 48-year-old study groups, whereas we have data from actual uh, players, actual student athletes. Yeah. You know, and yeah. myocarditis and cardiovascular issues that arise from viruses are not new to us, implying that maybe it's new to the Big Ten and their and their medical team. Sure. And we know how to treat it and we know how to get athletes to recover from it. Yeah. And then you get the Michigan doctor and the doctor coming out from Great Britain and now the doctor for the NBA, all just humiliating the medical team yeah. uh, that the Big Ten has. And I feel bad, I feel bad for Iowa, you know? Yeah. I, I, I'm worried that President Harold and the team physicians and everything are going to get swooped up in this yeah. when they went completely the opposite direction. A hundred percent. From what I heard, um, and I'm sure you've talked to Keith as well, uh, you know, Barda stood in front of him and was like, I, I tried, I, I tried. Yeah. Like, yeah. and, and yeah. I, you know, I don't follow – before I was a student athlete, I didn't follow, you know, the faculty and the decisions that Barta made in his career. Um, Bruce Harold came in while I was there uh, as, as an athlete. So I, I'm more familiar with kind of how he's handled things and, you know, his in, involvement. Um, and they, they tried, 
like I th- I think that's something that the people don't quite understand. And then I saw a bunch of people, um, you know, and we'll t- we'll t- we'll talk about the sports getting cut. Um, a bunch of people coming after Barda and Harold about cutting those four programs, and it's like you're yelling at the guys who are on your <laughs> are who, fighting for it. who are on your side. Like right. it, yeah. it it hurts. And and I'm I'm after you know after I talk with you in, in an hour or so, I'm going to talk with a. Uh, a gymnast who no, who no longer has a college career at this point. Right. Um, and, and that's going to be a really interesting conversation, but I think, I think where this goes is it's just really unfortunate that, like you said, the leadership is, is really non-existent and just at, at, at some base level, just confusing at this point. Right. No one, no one is in control it seems. And, um, I'd like to, I want, I would be interested in your opinion. What, cause now there's the whole talk of, well, the universities are going to start suing the big 10. Um, and you know, now in all honesty, I haven't heard that talk, but I have heard the parents and the parents are going to start suing the big yeah, 10. I have not heard any feedback or gotten any feedback from any university taking action against the big 10. I understand it. Right. Uh, I've been on multiple calls and there's one tonight. I mean, of course, you know, the whole Tom Mars deal yep. and, and Mars just filed against Ohio state, uh, mm-hmm. under FOIA. And I know more are coming. Uh, and I, and I'll tell everybody, do not listen to the replies on Twitter and people who claim to know what the heck's going on. Cause they don't have a clue. Yeah. Twitter has no idea. Yeah. And, and there's another organization that has retained attorneys that are holding calls this weekend, deciding a course of action to take. And I can tell you from an Iowa parent standpoint, again, it's never really been our goal. We never mentioned attorneys or getting attorneys or anything right. else. We were, we were hoping the Big Ten and the presidents would, uh, you know, be big boys. And like you said, show leadership and actually talk. Right. Uh, they haven't. Uh, as, as you know, we've sent it to both Big Ten and the presidents. Not only have we not received a response, we haven't received an acknowledgement of even getting it yeah. uh, and, and seeing these letters. Uh, so taking that action is not out of the question for us, uh, but we need the information. So uh, I can tell you our point is just to, as of right now, uh, is to wait and see what this freedom of information uncovers and once we have that data and that information we can actually make an educated decision on what to do next absolutely as as opposed to just making a decision based out of anger right which is obviously what you want to avoid because there's a lot of emotion that goes into this um you know one of those one of those emotions especially for you as a as a parent of a senior athlete i mean keith is going into what was supposed to be his last year right like right. um and and especially in keith's specific situation with the year he had last year uh a, a lou grows a year in my in, in my <laughs> opinion yeah you, I, you know any argument out of me there man you know you know i no, you know, I, what do I know? I was right. only, I only started 53 games as a specialist in at division yeah. one. Um, yeah. but I'm not on, you know, I'm not on the committee. So, um, mind boggling. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's a whole other conversation for right. another hour, but, um, but Keith, this is a huge year for Keith and now it, it's up in the air. Um, and, and what boggles me is it's, it's still unknown. Like, is right. is he going to get, it, the problem is, is you you push this season to the spring, and how does that? How do you expect a player who needs this season to play a spring season and also prepare for the draft that's supposed to go on seemingly at the end of that said season? Like, you know, you know, I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to ask you or even ask Keith because well, I, I talked. To- I want to ask you. <laughs> well. If, I've asked that question, but I've expanded on it a little bit. Right. And, and you obviously have the expertise in the area from a player standpoint. Yeah. What we're seeing right now, and again, this is all speculation, even having a spring season, speculation. But let's assume they do, okay? Mm-hmm. Here's what they're talking about. They're talking about eight games, and they're talking about using three domes. Yep. 
Okay, let's disregard the information that the CDC and all of the specialists say the healthiest and the safest thing to do is play outdoors in warmer weather. Yep. So of course the Big Ten says, let's wait until the winter and take it indoors. But irregardless, uh, they're glorified scrimmage games. Yeah, they don't mean anything. Right, so forget Keith. Let's look at these other players that take the beating and the pounding yeah. that Keith will never take and is never exposed to. Do you say, and let me ask you if this was presented right. to you, yep. you know what? I got another year of eligibility. I'm, I'm looking at the NFL. Do I risk injury playing in scrimmage games? It's funny. Do I, I, I opt out? Yeah, I just I just had this conversation uh, yesterday with a friend. I was uh, there's my wife and a couple friends here in Des Moines held a baby shower for a, another friend, um, and we were talking about it, and we were talking about Alaric a Jackson, uh, right. a great example, or or you know Chauncey Golston. Yeah, two any, guys. Any any running back, any quarterback, any right. you know guys. Lineman. Yep, guys who. Guys who, you know, Alaric, some would say he's, he's kind of locked in, but there's plenty of guys you could go down the roster and say, you know, they need, they need a season. They need right. one more, they need one more go at it. And they need, you know, they got a little proving to do. They, yeah. they can, they can up that grade from a seventh round, maybe free agent to a solid draft pick or from a right. fifth to seventh round grade to a, you know, a higher round grade. And my answer is because you mentioned it. The whole the whole key issue here is that these games in the spring, especially if you've got the SEC and the ACC playing this fall, those games mean nothing. They no, they no longer mean anything to any player, and they shouldn't. And yeah. so, in my opinion, if I'm one of those guys and I need another season, but I'm not going to try and force the spring, I sit out. I'm sitting out. Yeah. Well, and let me ask you too. I don't, I know Keith said they're starting to train again, right? but to what extent they can train and how game ready can they get? I mean, you, you tell me, what are they looking at from a prep time and do they have enough time to even start games in January and be in game shape? Yeah. That's the issue with, that's the issue here is, you know, I, I'm, I'm into strength and conditioning and you know, those my, Right. My degree, exercise science. And so I, I follow a ton of guys in the space. Um, I still am in contact with, you know, the guys who were, who were the, the strength coaches while we were there. And in my opinion, the, the answers, it, it, and it, it's, it's comical because the right. idea is let's, let's keep them safe. Right. The whole idea yeah. is let's keep them safe and healthy. Well, let me tell you a great idea to not keep players safe and healthy. We try and have two seasons in the same year. Yeah. Um, in, in my yeah. opinion, and Jeff Brome, we went over it a little bit. Jeff Brome, the Purdue coach, came out with a proposed spring season all the way through fall season into 2022. And it looked okay. And the prep time and the, and the training periods were okay. Injury rates would still be at an all-time high. Right. Uh, quality of play would probably be at an all time low still right. like even right. with these measures and even then you're taking a severe risk because the way that college strength conditioning programs are built except for guys like Keith or like me when we played you know the guys who are gonna be, you know you talk to Drake or Kevin even Kevin who wasn't a starter yeah he played 30 you know, he was playing 25 to 40 reps a game on all four special teams, occasionally getting a rep or two on defense. Those guys wake up the next morning and are broken. They are broken yeah. because that's yeah. just the, that's the level of, and it's not, that's not pity party, but that's what they want. That's what they signed up for, but they need, you know, three, four days to recover from one game. Right. And that is at a level of conditioning that took eight months to get to January to August is a, is an eight month period that is just crafted with perfection. But from a strength conditioning standpoint that builds your body up to be ready for three to four months of a beatdown. Yeah. 
and well, not to not to take over your show, but let no, me ask good. you take it. Let me ask you to, and and we take it from a different approach. Okay. Yeah. We just saw four sports get cut. Yep. We we see layoffs from the staff. Mm-hmm. So you come to these players now and you say, okay, Mr. Kluver, we're going to play eight games that are essentially meaningless. We need the money, or we're going to lose more. <laughs> yeah, I. That's. Are you a selfish? Be, are you a selfish football player, or do you care about these other guys? Yeah, that would be an incredible situation to be put yeah, in. But that's um, essentially what they put you guys. I say you guys, the players. That's essentially what the position they put them in. Yeah, you're right. Um, you're right. I I don't know, and this is where the answer is like. I, I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. It, so, so for, so for now, someone like for someone like me, very easy. Right. Well, and I get it, Keith. Not right. uh, sure. Let's play. No problem. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah. But Tyler Goodson, you know, Mackay, go on down the road. You yep. know. Yeah. Uh, I understand. Now the position they put him in is you guys are in a no-win situation, players, because mm-hmm. they opt out. They're selfish. We need the money. We need you to play. Right. You know. It's and that's the true level of rage is the incompetence and the lack of leadership has now set these players up to be the scapegoat regardless of their decision. Yeah. And it's, it's, what's unfortunate is, and it's, it's what I always come back to when I get in a conversation about this right now is we're, we're ruining two seasons because of one. Right. Yeah. Uh, That's what's, that's, what's really unfortunate. I don't know if, you know, you, you run into a whole other scholarship issue, you know, Every, yeah. So the NCAA came out a couple days ago and, and said everybody gets an extra season of eligibility, right? Right. Now, I know that half of those guys aren't going to come back because who knows if they even get to stay on scholarship or they get paid for that. But Well, here, I mean, the NCAA says you get your scholarship. You still get it? Yep. The great, the great unknown is cost of attendance, you right. know, up to the school, which somebody in our case is huge. Uh, yeah, unreal. You know, yeah, yeah, because you know, you're asking everybody, and and I, I'm not saying woe is me by any means, because I know comparably I'm in a I'm in a great situation. But you take the single parents and everything, and all of a sudden you say, we just dropped a thousand dollars a month on you. Yep. Uh, and you look at somebody. Sorry for using the name. Uh, I'll hear from them later, maybe. But like Spiewak, who's not on scholarship, paying out of state tuition. Yep. And he was set up to be the starter this year. Yeah. Does he stick around to get him to finally realize his dream at uh, the cost of, you know what I mean? Uh, there, it, it sucks all the way around. There is, and, and obviously, like you said, every situation is different, but there may be no more singular person I feel for than Austin Spiewak. Um, right. I, I get it. I, you know, yeah. he was, he came in and was there for the first two years that I was there sat or maybe the first year and a half or whatever sat behind me for two years sat behind subert for two years yeah walked on out of state red shirted grinded for four years i know that pain as a parent too oh oh my god all for for one season yeah and and now this has gone it's unbelievable um well I appreciate all your thoughts on that and, and, and the, the parent perspective. Um, yeah. I, I can tell you this, I, I, you know, my mother has been on, on those, uh, those I've parent ch- calls as I've well. Ch- I've chatted with her a few times. I and like she, her. She's a big fan of you as well. She, yeah. <laughs> she said that you're, you, you, you're fiery and, and she really enjoys and, that. And, and buyer as well, Don Byer. Yeah. If, uh, uh, and, and Gail Corner. If I were to get into a bar fight, I want those three ladies with me. <laughs> I love it. What have those yeah. calls been like the, you know, aside from trying to figure out, you know, Tyler, I'm glad you asked that. Yeah. That's, that's great. Cause it's surprising. You've sat in business meetings with more than one person. Yeah. And, and the corporate world is we need to have a meeting to, to, to decide if we're going to hold a meeting kind of crap. Yeah. And we started with 30 or 40 parents. And the very next call, we had over 200 parents. Oh my God. On the call. And not everybody agreed with what we're doing. Right. You know, uh, but you get that many people, uh, you're not going to get a consensus in a month that the sky's blue. Right. But everybody sat on goal. 
And the goal isn't to play football right now. The goal is to be transparent and give us access to this medical information that you're using because my God, you're making it sound horrible. You know, yeah. we're all going to die. Right. Uh, and you're not giving us any info. And it's so bad that you're not even asking for ADs and players' opinions. It's just, yep. you know, and everybody agreed with that and everybody stayed on mission and we were able to set goals and procedures and next steps clockwork. And it, it was amazing how all the diversity that makes up the Iowa Hawkeyes could get together and in under an hour with 200 people, knock it out. Yeah. Regardless of their opinions or anything else, incredible, absolutely incredible. The parents have been amazing. It sounds like quite an experience. Almost, almost a a silver lining kind of bright light out of the whole situation is how it's brought, you know, the fam. You know, because y- you guys get to connect. You see each other at the games. You sit in the parent section. You learn different yeah. families, become friends. But it's almost another level of connection between the Hawkeye family and and that group. Well, and, and, and being so far away, we're a thousand miles to every game. Yep. Uh, and you hear, you know, Hawk nation and support and things like that. And it's like conceptually kind of being on the outside, that sounds wonderful, but in a scenario like this, you really realize the truth behind it all. You know, I get to firsthand now experience it and be involved in it. Exactly. Even somebody that can be as volatile as I can be, (laughs) communicating with somebody that is not at all it's 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 been really cool really cool and it's something now and I've told the parents this it's been my biggest regret now that I'm at the end of my tour you know is to not have been able to hang out more and develop more relationships yeah you know along those lines yep uh because it is it is something unique and something special yeah I think uh I, I think I could speak for, you know, Hawkeye Nation. They're, 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 we're proud to have you as, as part of the Hawkeye family. And I appreciate we're pr- it. We're proud to have Keith as well. Yeah, Mama's disappointed because uh, she doesn't think he's ever going to come home. He's just going to stay there. He, you know, it's a pretty good place. It's not, yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. a bad place. Um, right. Keith, I, and I want to finish this, this episode on a lighter note because Keith has been – not just with his performance. And, and, and I don't think that the, you know, now that the Twitter ban has been lifted, Keith has had some fun with that. Yeah. And, and yeah. he, and obviously I don't have to tell you, Keith is, he's just a likable guy, right? Like he's he, a personality a little bit. He, he is just, he's yeah. a one, he's a one in a million. Um, yeah. From the minute he stepped on campus, you know, there's, there is this kind of older guy, you got to be, you got to be the kind of stern figure, show the, show them the ropes kind of thing in, in that kind of scenario where, you know, this is serious. This is division one football. And it, it, they kind of, the coaches delegate it to the older players in each position group. Like, Hey, it's your job now as an older guy who has experience to make sure these young guys have their shit together. And Keith, Keith was easy, man. He was, he was never a problem. He was always likable. He always liked to work hard and he's had just one of the most interesting four or five year careers that you could have. (laughs) Right. Um, 26. I'm used to to, uh, feeling rage and happiness and rage and taking that, taking that roller coaster ride just by watching him from 2016 to now. It's, it's incredible. You know, 2016 is his first season and right? 16, 17, 18, yep, yep, 20. Yep. He comes in, you know, I'm in my fourth or my third year starting, um, you know, and wedding to North Carolina, Keith Duncan, he's coming in. And when well, he's this, he's this big. And he's, he's, yep, he's a, he's yeah. the size of a Tic Tac, but yeah. he can kick the, he can kick the damn thing. And, you know, we just lost Marshall Kane, great kicker. It's going to be between Miguel and Keith. And, you know, Miguel struggles a little bit in camp and now Keith is the guy. Um, And, and what was that like? What was that like um, as a parent, especially so far away? What were the expectations leading? Shocking. Yeah. And then leading all the way through, you know, the highlight of that season, Keith Duncan is the hero against Michigan 
Right. Take me kind of through the emotions of that first season. Yeah, it was, you know, because obviously we were ready to go to Furman. Yeah. You know, it wasn't exactly the recruiting year of the kicker, regardless right. of all the records and everything that he set. And, you know, I'll get into as deep as you want to go, but I don't know how much everybody knows, you know, the John Casey, Jason Baker, Coach Wallace yep. relationship that got us the call in January. And I would love to hear it because I don't think I've heard that. Yeah, ba basically what it is is, uh, well, it, it, it started October-ish. Okay. And Jason Baker, Iowa punter, is playing for the Carolina Panthers. Yep. And what we learn later on is he's kind of the consultant, you know, where he receives a lot of video and give us your opinion, that kind of thing. Yep. And that year, he had received 30-some-odd video of kickers to watch and got a hold of Wallace and said, I don't like any one of them, but let me check with John Casey, who is a, a kicker, who is an AD at a local private school here. And Casey said, you know, now that you mentioned it, there is one kid who's setting records all over the place, and it just so happens that we, we play him this Friday. Yeah. And that game, Keith went three for three, all beyond 40, and hit a walk off from 46 yards to win the game. De decent outing. And, and Baker, Baker saw, and, and to Baker's credit, you know him, you know, he's, oh, he's, he's a very emotional, outspoken, you know. No, I, Baker's very, yeah. uh, I can't intense. Wait to, I can't wait to have Baker on the podcast, actually. Yeah, he's intense. So he... He called back and said, fundamentally, under pressure, this is the kid you want. And that's when we got the call. Still oblivious to all of this stuff. We just right. know somehow Iowa heard a key. Yep. So we packed up the car and drove out. And we, we were getting there on a Saturday. We left on a Thursday, stopped in Kentucky for the night. And, of course, the worst snowstorm hits Kentucky while we're asleep. Of course. And somehow I woke up at 3 in the morning. I was like, damn it, Keith, we got to go, or we stand, we stand no chance of making it. So we made it and uh, met with Coach Wallace and at the time Coach White, went through it all and then went and sat at Buffalo Wild Wings right there at the Fed Mall. Yes, sir. And I looked at Keith, you know, because there was no promises. Right. The only promise was is you're going to legitimately compete for the spot. Yep. And if you get the spot, all we know is Coach Ferentz likes to scholarship his starters. Yeah. We were like, cool. Uh, so we went and talked, and Keith said, I'll be right back. And he went outside and came back in. I said, what's up? He said, I just called Furman and told him I'm going to Iowa. Wow. Uh, yeah. And then Furman, of course, called back, and, hey, we got more money. Private of school. Of course they did. Private school, FCS, they have a little bit more scholarship restrictions, you know, that kind of thing. And and that visit, he was committed. Uh, and and – you know, June, we're driving back to Iowa and dropping them off, staying at Dom, have a good time, see you later. Yep. And I'm not thinking anything. I'm like, I mean, I know what he's, I know what he's like. I mean, it, 45 yards and in, I'd put him up against anybody at the time, at yep. the time. I'd put him up against anybody. I don't care who it is. Uh, Keith has always understood the game from soccer to baseball. He's been able to sit back and watch the game and understand what needs to be done to give himself the best chance of success. Yep. And I'll give you the Michigan kick was a perfect example. Mm -hmm. you know, I asked about him after other ways. He said, dad, I just, I saw them all stacked up in the middle. I knew they were coming up the middle. I knew they were a man short and he was on my right, their left. So I knew I had to go right center. Uh, and sure enough, I go back and look at the video and I go, I'll be damned. They're stacked in the middle. They only got 10 guys on the field. They're missing a guy on their left side. Yep. And there we go. Uh, but, that's, but that's him. He's done that with baseball. He's done that. And, and, and he's got the unique gift of thriving on pressure. Yeah. I want it, you know, where a lot of them will be like, no thanks. You know, yeah. good I luck. Re I relate with that a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's, been, his, that's been his strength. And then to go through – the Iowa system and to see how much bigger he's gotten, how much stronger he's gotten, 
from 55 and in, I'll put them up against anybody. Anyone. Yeah. Anyone. Yeah. The, you know, and again, back to the interesting career, 16 goes by. Awesome. Great. 17 now is my senior year. And, you know, it's kind of expected that Keith is probably the guy, at least from the, from the outside, but Miguel decides that he's just going to, I mean, it it, it was incredible to see too, because they made each other so good. Right. But and got to be good friends. Incredibly good friends. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Because Miguel is just the nicest kid in the world. I mean, a little weird, but nicest kid in the world. He'll be the first to tell you that. Oh, for sure. Um, but, but Miguel comes in just as balling out and Miguel is, has a hell of a leg and, and Miguel ends up winning the job. And so now Keith is after being the hero of a big time knockoff big 10 or uh, top 10 opponent in Kinnick stadium at night. Now all of a sudden he's red shirting his second year. Right. Um, what were the, emo- what were the emotions like? Well, again, roller coaster. Uh, Cause you sit there and you go, okay. If your goal is to go to the NFL at his size, playing four years and being done is not a good idea. We'd love to have the extra year. Right. You know, so red shirt initially, you know, we sit there and at the time we now hate coach Woods because they went, they went through the, they went through the change in coaching there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Oh my God, because the feedback we're getting from Keith is he's neck and neck. You know, Miguel may have him by a percentage or so, but Keith's being told that he hasn't done anything to lose his job. And it was, it was just, it was as close as it could be. Yeah. Now, if it's, if it's clear, you know, whatever, Miguel's got the stronger leg, pressure kicks, I'm a little bit ahead. Overall, he's a little bit ahead. And I don't know what's true. And I don't know what just, you know, what the kid's feeding to relax his parents. Cause you know, camp, camp, we're on like oh, this oh yeah you know uh, I mean it was the same thing last year you know with camp yep uh, you know you don't know and then oh my god I lost it and I don't understand why because I think that was the year and you can tell me the Monday you got back from camp the first day of game prep Miguel just had a horrible practice day didn't make anything absolutely the, absolutely trash I mean yeah had yeah. that had the camp of his life turned it around must have spent the whole year from the time he, he kind of shit the, shit the bed in camp the yeah. year before and thought this camp is going to be insane. And he, he just went off in camp right? And, and game week rolls around and Monday's Monday's field goal day. And I've, I've net, I, I was, I was, I was like, <laughs> yeah, what the hell's going on? I was like, it, did I had to like almost look at myself. I was like, did I snap that? Or like, yeah. I, I was like, wow. That, I mean, we got absolutely, torn to shreds and the entire yeah. team to the point to where it got to it was just like just leave the field yep they told us that they they, they quit the period we yeah. walked off and and this and i remember i'm I actually have goosebumps from it right now yeah I, as the senior leader of that unit i thought wow we yeah we just embarrassed ourselves yeah and then i understand from key speed back of course is like it hit everything yeah and, and he was like okay if they're counting Monday and everything uh, and yeah. the season that I just came off of. Right. And then to hear it, you're like, Oh my God, you know, and then, and it's like, what's up. And then you just relax. Okay. Red shirt. We need it. Yep. And then, and then you go into his, now his junior year, yep. red shirt, sophomore, and you go through the camp and he had a good camp touch better than Miguel percentage wise. And you're like, okay, great. And then the feedback is, is no, we're going to keep Miguel because he didn't do anything to lose his job. Right. And then of course we're saying, well, what the hell did Keith do to lose his job? Right. How is, how is double standard? It's that, it's that roller coaster, right? But I'll look back and I'll tell you two things. Number one, those two years were the best football watching years that I've had so far. Yep. You, you know, cause you're not, there's no pressure. He's not coming out oh, there. So yep, exactly. the games are an absolute blast to watch. Cause I go crazy watching these things. Yeah, I amazing. am yet to see him make a field goal live. You turn uh, around. Yeah, yeah. Or, or go, I've got my spot right around the corner over here. Yep. 
My, and I wait, my mom I wait, used to be the same way. I wait for the yelling and screaming in the house, and then I know it's all good, and I come back and watch replays. So that, <laughs> and, then, and then number two, it ended up being the best thing that could happen to Keith. Yep. You know, from a work ethic standpoint. Mental uh, toughness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But mental, everything that he needs to go to that next level. Mm-hmm. Had he not gone through that, I don't think he would have been as prepared. I talked to him a lot during those two years. Um, I mean, obviously, one of them, I was still there. Uh, and then in, in, in 18, um, I talked to him a lot because I was still, you know, trying to be around the program and stuff. And uh, he was a mature kid. You know, like you said, he, he, knew, he knew the game. Right. Fundamentally, he was, he was pretty locked in. And, he, and was mature as far as, like, how to go about it mentally as well. Um, but those two years, again, looking back, invaluable experience right yeah uh, absolutely with, with having to deal with adversity adversity and then to come back last year and have that kind of year yeah. i cannot imagine how proud of a parent you were just to i yeah, mean that, I've, been, I've been asked that by the reporters a lot you know the pride and everything and 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 i try to explain it to them watching your kid play you yeah. know yeah, he had a great year. Yeah, he's got some recognition and everything. But for me, it's no different than a parent going and watching their kid play t-ball. It, yeah. It's joy. It's not right. so much pride. Yep. The pride comes in what I hear he's doing off the field. Sure. You know, yeah. and the letters that we get from parents who, you know, I'm, I'm traveling from Texas to Iowa, taking my kids to say goodbye to their grandmother, who is, you know, at desk door kind of thing. And we stopped by Kinnick to, you know, and hey, it's not football season. You can just see the stadium. And he said, one of my kids disappeared through the bars in, in going down into the stadium. And, and I walk around and I find an open door and me and my other son finally see him down on the field and a guy's walking up to him and we're like, Oh God, we're getting arrested. You know, my six year old <laughs> only to find out that the guy picks up a football and he's, and he's playing catch and he's doing handoffs and chasing him to the end zone. And then he walks, he walks the kid back up to us and it's Keith Duncan. And he gives us a tour of the athletic facility and introduces us to some basketball players. And we got an autographed baseball from a baseball player. And all of that, when we're going to say goodbye to my mom and their grandmother, that's the stuff that we take pride in. Stories a, like that. That's an incredible know? story. Yeah. yeah, things like that. That's, that's cool. But watching him, that's no different than any parent yeah. watching their kid. It's, sure. it's joy, not, not pride. Yeah. And, and that's um, why we don't want it to end. Exactly. Which is, which is, you know, kind of then where we leave it because it's all up in the air. And I, I hope yeah. so much that, that Keith gets an opportunity. Um, I would, I would like to think that through all of this, somehow, some way it, it's going to happen. He's, he's going to, yeah. there's going to be. Gonna take, it's going to take somebody who knows kicking. Yep. To, to take to, and I think he'll get a shot. Yep. You know, because it, it just even here, and cut me off if you got to hit it. But even out here in the off season, you know, working with Joey Sly from the Panthers, yep. who, who works with Keith's kicking coach here, they're kicking together. Yep. And the first thing Sly says is, why don't you kick the ball higher? Yeah. You know, and this is an NFL guy with a big leg. And Keith and the coach both look at him and go, where I kick and what I do, I can't. Right. And you get feedback from Baker to where if you're kicking in bad weather or with wind, you gotta, want Keith's ball. Got to cut it. Yeah. It's not as high as Miguel or a right. lot of these, but does it clear the line and will it clear the line in every instance? Yes. Yep. You know, will it cut through the wind and can he control it? Yes. Yes. Does he stand a better chance at making a kick in wind and outdoor Big Ten weather? Then, yeah. So it's, it's going to take somebody that knows kicking. Yep. To say, okay, cool. And, yeah. And, yeah. And oftentimes it's unfortunate because it is this, this yeah. niche kind of special teams is so 
It's like the pitcher whose fastball is only 90 miles an hour. Right, but he can yeah. throw it any spot he wants. Um, yeah, and, and has two or three other pitches. Yeah, he um, – yeah. it, 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 it takes that little bit of luck, and I've had a yeah. shitload of it in my own yeah. career um, just with getting to Iowa and then getting a chance. And uh, Well, I want, these people to, I want these people to look at what you guys throw, go through and what's all involved from a long snapper to a holder to a kicker for a successful kick. Yeah, it's you know, I and, and I the easiest thing for me to do is compare it to golf. How wide are those goalposts that you're kicking at? Ten uh, yards? Yeah, something like that. Okay, so the average golfer is hitting into a 40-yard fairway, 40-yard yeah. width fairway. Takes all day long to stand above the ball. Yep. The ball's standing still. Yeah, there's and no he defense. still misses the fairway, yeah. you know? And these guys are like, oh, kicking's easy. You gotta be kidding me. I was like, okay, you got a long snapper. That's seven to eight yards away. That's snapping it to another guy that has to put it on your golf tee. And you have to do it in 1.3 seconds with 11 other people yep. running at you talking about your mom. They have no and kick idea. It, and kick it through something that's 10 yards wide. It's like, you guys are out of your mind. Yeah. They, uh, and it's why the long snapper and the holder are so valuable to us. To yeah. where it's worth taking him to Atlanta and, and everything else like that. Because... And it's kind of what I kind of wanted to ask you two things about, about 2016 and Michigan and then the ball game Yep, is without that timing, Mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's a goat and not the good kind. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, So, so go to 2016, go to Michigan. Yep. Uh, I've always wondered what Tyler Kluver thought about that snap and, and everything. (laughs) Cause I know you were dead nuts the whole year long and I'm sitting there looking at that going oh my god did that just look weird or no, was it not your typical Tyler Kluver long snap uh it it, it I'll be honest it wasn't uh it, it the hands got a little sweaty on that one oh, I imagine I um, imagine you know yeah so um, so I had, I'm, I had, I'm, I'm asking you this because I don't want to give Kaluzi any credit whatsoever. You yeah. Know? And I don't either at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I had some experience with, uh, with the year before, um, yeah. we, Marshall. Yeah. We, we had played yeah. pit pit came to town Yeah, night game, first night game in like a, a few years, I think like three years and the place was jacked. You know, I don't know if you know the story of Brett Greenwood, but he had led us yeah. out on the field and yeah, uh, just emotional night and was supposed was, to be a yeah was supposed to be a good game and it, it came right. down to you know we're tied uh, I think it was twenty one twenty one. Um, well, he was from fifty six, wasn't it? Fifty seven. Fifty seven. Yeah. And so, it. and so you know, nothing to lose like the Michigan game, because we're tied. Right. So if, Mar- you know, right. if Marshall – and it's from 57, right? So it's almost like, you know, you put money down on this, you're probably betting against it. Right. And so I, I, it was good because it gave us that, that game winner walk off. You know, if you, guys, if you guys perform, you're the heroes kind of thing. Right. And I had sent back a snap, you know, and this is my – that was my second year – or no – yeah, that was my second year starting. So, you know, it's less experience under my belt. And I'd sent back a snap that was into Dylan Kidd's body. And it was kind of, you know, the, the, the face had kind of tilted up. And I didn't, I basically gave him like a, hey, I'm just going to get this to you. And you, yeah, get, it, yeah. you yeah. get it down, right? Right. And so I got a little bit better on the Michigan one. Yeah. But, but I let the thought creep into my head right before – we kind of came back live for the kick. Like the, the game's in your hands. The game yeah. is literally in your hands. Right. And, and I always had problems overthinking and getting sweaty hands, but you, well, and you got a guy lined up right on your head too. Right, right on top of you. Right. It's, yeah. it, there is no more pressure filled situation. Right. Um, and, and I've done it a million times. I you know, and that's what I always fell back on. You, you fall to the level of your training. You never rise to the occasion. You fall down to the, to the level that you've trained at. And, you know, so I felt confident. I'm going to get it back there. It's going to be a spiral, but it just gets a little bit off of your, uh, off of your norm. And so I, yeah. I tried to give him the best snap I could. Um, laces weren't where they needed to be. But... Man, we can't see all of that stuff. So it's like a lot of them. I go back and I ask Keith, man, that looked like a bad snap. He said, no, it was dead nuts. I just sucked. 
you right. know, that and, kind of thing. And, and, and so, you know, I, I give the snap probably like a seven out of 10. Like it was definitely, okay. it was definitely good, but it wasn't yeah. great. Yeah, okay. And, and okay. I think, I think what's great about Keith um, is Keith always understood that regardless of what that snap looks like or what that hold looks like, I'm going to have to kick whatever's there on the, on the plate. Right. And right. so, and so he did a great job of like never letting that affect him. Um, yeah. And so with a good snap and a, a pretty good hold, um, you know, we gave Keith enough and it worked. He, he did the rest. Yeah. 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 It worked. Well, what the, was other the, thing I, the other thing I wanted to ask you about yep. that really manifested itself at that Outback Bowl was the death threats. Yeah. And this is what, this is what I wanted to ask Kulik about. Cause if I remember correctly, Kulik was out. That's when he had that little owie on his leg. He, he had a, he had a slight, yeah, a slight, yeah. Little... <laughs> slight fracture. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Keith was like, Oh no, I get death threats all the time. But this one Fair amount. was a little bit more specific. Yeah. In in that, okay. Describe the car that he drove where he lived, yeah. when you guys were landing, you yeah. know, things like that. And it's like, uh-oh. He goes, I'm going to go share it with Ference's bodyguard, is how yep. he described it. Yep. And the guy came over and talked to me, and I'm looking at this guy like, you're his freaking bodyguard? you kidding me. You're my size. Right. You're not intimidating at all. Right. Uh, and he was going through, and he was like, I'm going to go make some phone calls. I'll be right back. And I wanted to get, because Keith tried to describe what Kulik's reaction was. Yeah. You know, and that's what I wanted to ask Drake about right. was, yeah. you know. No, Drake was, Drake was 100% ready to kill anyone. <laughs> that's what, that's you know, what I, I heard. Give him my address. Give him my phone number. Yeah, Drake, Drake's the type of guy who, especially with, after Keith had proved himself and kind of like was the hero that year, Drake's the kind of guy who's like, and I'm not joking when I say this, like people who listen, they know Drake, they know like how nuts he is. If, if it came down to it and it was like one or the other, Drake would murder someone. He would actually, <laughs> yeah. he would actually kill somebody if it came down to it. And so Drake was, Drake kind of took that role of like, no one's messing with Keith and I'll, yeah, make, so I'll here, make sure here, of it. Here you, here you got this guy ready to battle and he's, his leg, he's missing a leg yep. and uh, yeah, all of that. But I, I said that, you know, for any Iowa, upcoming Iowa parents, Iowa security is legit. Yeah. Because in, in about 30 minutes from him telling me I'm going to make some phone calls, I'll be back. The guy came back and said, okay, he had, he works at, he works at Jimmy John's. He lives in his mom's basement. He's 33 years old. He has three separate Facebook accounts oh, gosh. and you should get a message in the next hour. So in that amount of time, he had all of that information and somebody knocking at this guy's door because about 45 minutes later, Keith came back and showed me the Facebook message. Like, man, I'm real sorry. I just get wrapped up in Michigan football and yep. I live in my mom's house and yep. you know, I just get, and I was like, Holy cow, who is this guy? Yeah, it, Keith. Keith with his kicks has has upset some people, and uh, yeah. I, you know, sometimes sometimes he he sends them to me, and he, and Keith has taken it in stride. He kind of just laughs it off. Uh, it he is, tells me he goes, I, I toss the I toss the good ones, I keep the bad ones. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, so I was like, oh, all right, you're. He's one approach that I would take. He's one interesting guy. Yeah, yeah. He's one interesting guy, but we love having him. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure to have Keith as part of the hockey program and, and now one of my buddies. And it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Steve. I appreciate it, Tyler. It's been, uh, it's been fun. Thank you guys listening. This is episode 138 of the Wash Up Walk-Ons podcast. As always, uh, so glad that you came and, and listened to our conversation. We'll talk at you again soon. See ya.